All right, good morning again. If you have your Bibles with you, we are going to be in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, continuing our series on a, a Game of Thrones on 1 Kings. Uh, all we're, we're fixing to get into it now, all the little politics and all the little shenanigans and power moves that people make to try and get upon the throne. Um, when we began this series, we compared it to the a Game of Thrones simply because there is so much struggle to see who's going to sit on the throne, the throne of a nation, the throne of our hearts, the throne of our church, our family, who is going to rule here. And the battles, the intrigue, the backstabbing, all the things that we go through to find out who's going to be king. Is Jesus going to sit on that throne or are we going to let try and usurp it from him? And we have been studying in this book of First Kings um, and uh, uh, we have seen Solomon. Solomon, who God worked through in a great way, but Solomon is told at the end of his life, uh, you know what, you disobeyed me. And so when you pass on, I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you. There's going to be a, a, a big split in the nation. And it's going to go not good for the people of God. There's going to be a remnant in the southern part, but there's going to be the majority in the northern part. And I'm tired of these people that won't obey me. So God lets them know that if they don't want the Lord to be king, then they're just going to have all kinds of kings. We entitled the message today, Divided We Fall. Um, let us begin in 1 Kings chapter 12. We're going to read verses 12 through 16. If it doesn't hurt too much on your knees or your back, would you, would you stand please for the reading of God's Word? Um, 1 Kings chapter 12. We're going to read verse 12 down through verse 16. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken to Ahijah the Shilonite, to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse, to your tents, Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. Let's pray. Help us, Lord. Help us to remember that you are the source of blessing. You are the source of unity. You are our strength and our hope. No matter who sits in the White House or in the City Hall or in the Governor's Mansion, Lord, if you are not our King, we shall truly fail. Help us, Lord. Help us to find that which unites us. And we ask it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We say our pledges, one nation under God. And I always loved that next word as a kid because I really didn't know what it meant. Indivisible. That we are united in these states. That there are 50 of them, but there's one nation. Remember when I was in seminary, we had some students from other countries, and one of them was trying to explain, now, why is Texas different than Oklahoma, and why don't they like each other? I thought it was the United States. Well, and the other guy goes, well, each state is really kind of like its own country and only likes itself. And that's kind of how we are, because let's face it, most of y'all don't like Oklahoma, and Oklahoma doesn't like you, right? And, uh, and, and we only get into Alabama, so... Um, but we, we, we have our regional affections, we have our favorite teams, we have where we're from is better than where you're from, and it's just like that. But we're also in a day and time where, you know, it's not funny anymore, our divisions. I mean, it's almost like we haven't seen this since the 1860s, where one side is telling the other side they don't belong, where the other side is saying to the other side, you're absolutely wrong on everything. And where we can't seem to find a middle ground. It's not unusual for nations to become divided, but it is tragic. 
And in our country, in our world, and in our churches, and in our homes, we see the same things taking place. That which ought to be united and making us strong, instead, we've divided. We're separating. We're falling apart. Solomon was given wisdom by God. When, when God said, I'll give you one thing, Solomon, one thing as you become king of Israel, whatever it is you want, I'll give it to you. And Solomon asked God for wisdom. Teach me how to do what's pleasing to you. And for the most part, Solomon did that, but there came a point in his life where he kind of got the big head and looked around and said, look at what I've done. And he began to kind of appreciate himself for all he was. And God finally comes down to him and says, Look, Solomon, you've done exactly what I told you not to do. You have gone after idols. You have gone after women. You have gone after material things. This isn't going to continue. When you die, Solomon, for David's sake, the promise he made to David, which also is ultimately going to result in the messianic line that brings us Jesus Christ, for the sake of that line, for the sake of the plan that's going to bring Jesus to us, I'm going to leave a small remnant here of my people. But the rest of the kingdom is going to be ripped away. And you must understand, Solomon, this has happened because of your sins. And so what we have here happening here as we begin in chapter 12 is the beginning of that great division. Yes, Solomon as king had built up a great nation, much influence. People were coming from all over to hear his wisdom. He was the most prosperous nation. He had expanded his borders. He had expanded influence. He had 700 concubines and wives, all made through political alliances. But he blew it all, as we saw a few weeks ago. Now, however, he has died. He had a son named Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was the heir to the throne. But Rehoboam sat down one day to get some advice. And so the men who advised Saul and the guys who were older, wiser, came to him and said, Rehoboam, whatever you do, kind of lighten up on the people. They built that multi-gazillion dollar temple for the Lord over the course of seven and a half years. They have expanded borders, supported the army, built lavish palaces. They're kind of tired and they've been overtaxed. They kind of need a break right now. You would win their hearts and minds if you kind of lighten up on them. That occurs in the first part of chapter 12. And then Rehoboam turns around and listens to his buddies. And they said, nah, dude, we got the keys to the throne now. We got the keys to the car. We got the key to the vault. You tell them. Man, if they thought it was bad before, wait, wait till they see what a hard case you are. You run them into the ground. You keep driving them. You push them even harder. What, what, what they thought was the thumb of Solomon is going, to be the, is going to feel like nothing compared to the boot of Rehoboam. Rehoboam listened to the wrong group. The passage we read jumps in with, uh, he had kind of laid the law down to the tribes, and the northern tribes kind of gathered around a guy named Jeroboam, who God had kind of told, you're going to be this one that's going to lead the, the, the opposing party out of the nation. So, he tells Jeroboam and his guys, let's get together in three days. And they get together, and here we have our passage. They get together, and Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day. That's the two guys. Jeroboam is the one leading the northern opposition group. Rehoboam is Solomon's heir, the king. They got together the third day, as the king had said, and said, come back the third day. And the king answered them roughly and said, look... <coughs> You guys come to me asking for mercy. Verse 14, my father made your yoke heavy. I will add to your yoke. My father whipped you with whips. I'm going to use scourges. Instead of just having a whip, he's going to have, you know, pieces of bone and stone on the end of those whips uh, to really dig in. And the king did not listen to the people. We find division happening when leaders don't listen. When people have been through too much. And now we come down, it looks like a split is coming on the way. But notice as we read in verse 15, the king did not listen to the people, but look at this. For the turn of events was from the Lord that he might fulfill his word. Yes, God had predicted to Solomon, because of your sin, this kingdom is going to split. So the first thing we want to know is as this kingdom starts to divide, that division was the will of God. There's a mysterious thing that goes on sometimes. From God's point of view, yes, he brought this about. 
From our point of view, it's this guy's pride, his disobedience, his arrogance. There's a mysterious thing of <coughs> where God's hand stops and our attitude starts. Where is it our responsibility and where is it something he did? Because God said, because of Solomon, I'm going to split this kingdom. Rehoboam listens to his younger foolish friends and by taking their advice, this all looks like it's on him. So whose fault is it? God knows us very well. And rest assured that when God says something will come to pass, it will come to pass. Your role in it may be something you don't realize you're actually playing because you're just being yourself and yet God is using you, your personality, and who you are and working out His will in this situation. So what happens here is this. Judah is going to include the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and the city of Jerusalem and that lower portion of the kingdom of Israel. That's going to stay under the control of Rehoboam, the king's son. And then the northern part is going to be called Israel. And Israel is going to be those other ten tribes. Um, and, I, and I'm sharing this with you because I want you to look. Pretty much from here on out in your Old Testament, I mean, this much thickness in your Bible, this is the situation you've got in Israel. When you look at when they're saying all of Judah, they're talking about this southern kingdom that stayed uh, with the king. And when they're talking about Israel, they're talking about the northern ten tribes. Uh, as time goes by, the northern ten tribes will be so disobedient to God, within three, four hundred years, they're all going to be captive by the Assyrians, never to return. That is where that phrase, the lost tribes of Israel, comes from. Truth be told, God hasn't lost them. He says he will regather them someday. So, um, and then the southern kingdom, Judah, is the one that still maintains, you know, the connection with God. Some of their kings are good, some of their kings are bad. They get captured by the Babylonians and are returned. And then we have the books of Nehemiah and such. So, Basically, a whole lot of Old Testament history hinges on what's going on right here. That this split in the kingdom has major ramifications. But rest assured this, the Messiah's line will continue. See, God could have wiped them out, but He didn't. God could have destroyed them, but He didn't. Why? Because back in the garden, God made a promise that the seed of the woman would come and would crush the head of the serpent. That a Savior would come and help us deal with our problem of sin. And that seed, that Messiah, as we see as we read through the Old Testament, is going to be from the tribe of Judah. He's going to be a descendant of David. So it is necessary that that line continue. So that our Lord and our Savior, when the time comes, He is born of that kingly line. It was all God's plan. All of it. And he will work out his plan. When you see your country falling apart, don't think God's abandoned you. When you see your state, your city, even your family, don't think God has abandoned you. God is watching over his people. It is an awful time in which it is dividing, in which it is separating. But in the midst of all this, God is still there with him and still has plans. Because you saw how thick our Old Testament. We still got a bunch to go there. He's still working. It's not over yet. You and I may wonder where our country is headed. You and I may wonder what's going to be the result of all this mess. What's it going to be like here in America in 10 years from now, 15, 20 years? I got no idea. I'm not real optimistic, but I know this. Whatever happens, God will still be on his throne. We will still be his people. And we take comfort in that. And these things happen. People rebel against God. People turn their backs on God. We as a nation, we were all pretty well agreed. It seems like that's what we've done. We can't expect there to be no consequences to that. When that which we once called evil is now considered a virtue, we can't expect God to remain quiet. Nations get chastised. Nations get punished. Good, godly people suffer as a result of that. But we're still in God's hands. And we should be comfortable with that. When that nation starts to divide, when our fears begin to come to fruition, remember this, fall on your knees before the Lord. 
this is the direction it may be going, but this is the direction we need to go is keep going towards him. They may tell us to quiet. They may tell us our values are out of touch, that we are phobic and, and racist and everything else. We're just trying to serve the Lord. And we must continue to do that above all else. And if the world goes against us, so be it. God will still watch over us. Israel and Judah still have a history. They got a lot of adventures to go through here. This isn't the end of it all. And as you see in 1948, God restored the nation of Israel as one whole. And all these things we see God's hand. So hang in there with him. Now, we know that this division was God's will because Solomon disobeyed God and God put it in his plan and, and worked it out. Now, but from the standpoint of earth, we realize we got some responsibility. That Rehoboam and even Jeroboam, they both could have reacted a little bit different or maybe done things differently. Leadership often contributes to the decision, to the division rather. And we want to look at for a few moments how come sometimes we as leaders, even with our best efforts, we contribute to the division that's among us. Now, we know that Congress, what they've done, and presidents, what they do, and mayors, and governors, and all of them, but you know, sometimes it's us also. We who influence in the home, in the school, in the Sunday school, in the, in the streets of our neighborhoods, how do we contribute to that division? We need to examine how we contribute by the, contributing to the division by asking ourselves, whose voice do you listen to? Rehoboam was Solomon's son. He had a smart dad. Dad is dead. Who do you listen to? Well, you've got dad's old advisors, verses 10 and 11. The young men who had grown up with him spoke to, well, the, the advisors came to him in verse 7, rather. The older ones, Rehoboam asked the question in verse 6, how do you advise me to answer these people? In verse 7, the elders spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today, and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. See, sometimes as leaders, we need to listen to good advice. These guys told him, you know, King, if you'll consider yourself their servant instead of their master, these people will serve you day and night. Wouldn't it be nice that when, when politicians talked about public service, they really meant serving and not padding their pocket? That they really did get on the city council. They really did become a representative or a senator to make life better for the rest of us instead of to get six-figure speaking engagements. You know? Because that seems what happens. You know, nice, poor, humble people enter into Congress and come out millionaires. How does that happen on 170000 a year? You know? And, but this is what we're all crying out for. People who get into government and leadership... For the sake of the people and not for the sake of themselves. That's what these guys tell Solomon. Be a servant to him. But as we see in verse 10. The young men who grew up with him. His buddies. They said you should speak to the people. And say your father made your yoke heavy. Would you make it lighter on us? Well thus shall you say to them. My little finger will be thicker than my father's waist. In other words. My little finger is going to feel so heavy on you, it's going to be thicker and heavier than my father's midsection. The idea is this. I'm going to put it on. That's what you need to do, Solomon, is go after. Don't be their servant. Be their Lord, their master. And that's what happens. When we read verse 13, the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice which the elders had given. We've got to be careful who we're listening to. What strokes our egos, what pads our pockets, does not serve God's work in our lives and builds division. Listening to the wrong voices, listening to the wrong advice, listening to the ones that tell you what you want to hear instead of what you need to hear has been the downfall not only of politicians, but of parents and teachers and pastors all right down the line. And don't we sometimes wonder about our kids when they're listening to their friends instead of the people who love them the most? When we listen to the wrong voice, we divide families, we divide campuses, we divide cities, we divide counties, states, nations. All by listening, not to God, not to godly advice, but to that which we want to hear. A second area in which we contribute to this division, 
need to answer ourselves the question, are we going to lead with force or grace? See, the elders came to Solomon, and, or Rehoboam rather, and said to him, Look, serve these people. Listen to them. Reach out to them. Give them a rest. Give them a little bit of break on taxes. Give them a little bit of break on public service and, and military service. And, and don't be as aggressively expanding as your father was. We're good now. Let's just hold what we got for a while. But then his friends come in. No, you, you get an iron fist on them. You make your little finger feel like your dad's waist. You make it so that they just dread the thought of you. That's power. And some of us have grown up thinking that. Leadership needs to lead with grace. I say that because, yes, Jesus Christ will rule us with an iron rod someday. That sounds like force. But what's he been ruling with us with up till now? A wonderful sense of grace. Would you consider Jesus a weak leader? With the love, with the compassion he has, with the way he reaches out to each of us, trying to meet the needs. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And yet he also reaches down to meet our needs. To love us, to hold us up, to get us through. That is leadership. Leadership is not coming down with a sword or a gun. Leadership is not telling everybody, I'm in charge, do what I say. I realize there's situations like in the military where leadership needs to be unquestioned because many lives are at stake. But in churches, in families, in many businesses, you've got to consider leading with grace will carry you a lot farther than force. The attitudes we take in the workplace... How many of you all ever worked with somebody? You were side by side for years. They got the promotion. You were happy for them. And then what happened to their attitude? All of a sudden, they were in charge, right? And that's what these guys are trying to get Rehoboam to do. And successfully. So they get him to lead by force. Pray for leadership that leads by grace. Pray for leaders that truly do listen to Jesus Christ. That listen to God's word. If we will humble ourselves and pray maybe and, and seek God's face, maybe we can raise up a general leader, generation of leadership from among ourselves that one day kids from these churches around here would go to Congress and lead with compassion, with grace, with wisdom, doing the right thing and seeking the best of all of us. It's a dream we got. <laughs> and maybe someday. But there's another aspect they sometimes can contribute are you going to be a self-serving leader or a servant leader? And this is really the question right here that we're, we were just asking. Not only are you going to lead with force or grace, but who benefits when you step out of office? If you're old enough or lucky enough, you may on AMC or TMC channel, you've seen Mr. Smith goes to Washington with Jimmy Stewart. Going to Washington, and, and he goes up there with what every American wishes you'd go to Washington with the attitude of, that I'm going to do what's best for my constituency, what's best for America. And we love to hear stories of people come out of nowhere um, and make it into Congress and are able, you know, the Abe Lincoln thing, to, to become something great even with those humble beginnings. But we see too often people with those humble beginnings coming into Congress and suddenly making it about them. Maybe they're bartenders or other previous occupations and they get into Congress and now, oh, they've got the reins of this thing, don't they? And we start to see many who, while they campaign with serving all of us, they only had one person in mind. Some of you, there's a person who used to be a member of this church that once was considering running for city council of Corpus Christi. And he was very interested, thinking he could do a lot of good. But then he found out certain people came by to visit him and said, Brother, we will get you elected if you will do these things. They were going to put money in his campaign and make him beholden to them. And he couldn't do it. Because that's not why you'd want to be on city council. But... There are still people like that out there, but the pressures of money, the pressures of being serving yourself are too great. When I pastored in Louisiana, I got to eat lunch one day with our, our local representative to the state legislature. And, uh, and I said, do you have any, you know, I really liked the guy, what he was saying. He was pro-life, he was pro-freedom, a lot of things. And, and I asked him, well, are you going to go to Washington someday? It'd be great if you did. And he said, no, I think it would just ruin me. <laughs> 
He'd seen it happen time and again. And that's the tragedy of this country is to get the leaders we need. There are so many pressures out them and so many temptations to make themselves serving instead of servants. Look at verse 14. My father made your yoke heavy. I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. Leading is not an ego trip. It's servanthood. Yes, Jesus is going to have all nations praising his name. And we all think that's what I'd like. The, nation, the, the multitudes to adore and fear me. Well, Jesus earned that privilege how? By humbling self, himself as a servant. By living the sinless life. By laying his life down for every single one of us. And dying the death of a sinner and a thief. And in rising from the dead. Showing that he has the power over death and judgment. Yes, he receives the accolades of all, but he earned them humbly by humbling himself even to the death on the cross. Here's another aspect of how we contribute, and really probably Rehoboam's biggest problem here, and even Jeroboam's too. Can you learn from those who disagree? See, Rehoboam heard on one side, you know, take it easy on the people. From the other side, he heard, jump on them. Wear them out. He didn't think the elders had anything to say to a guy like him. I didn't like their message, but what if I had kind of taken a little bit of the compassion part, a little bit of the drop the taxes part, a little bit of the kind of ease up on the aggressive expansion part. When we decide that we alone are right. You ever been to a church business meeting? I know you have because we have them. Every once we have some really good ones that are just blessings and wonder. And then we have others that it's just basically, you know, you know it, it's hard to hammer out a compromise or to get agreement on. Um, other churches have actually split over such things as random as the color of carpet, the paint on the walls. Why? Because it's my way or no way. Even though I disagree with you, you have nothing to teach me. Let me tell you something. Sometimes y'all disagree with me, and I know you do, and probably more often than I even know about, and that's okay. <coughs> I honestly do make an attempt, because I heard something long ago. Sometimes when God gives you opposition in your church, it's to tell you to slow down and listen a little bit. And kind of re-examine where you're going and listen to those who are disagreeing. Not because they hate you, but they love this church also. And sometimes disagreement... In a business, in any other situation, is the same thing. Before you just mark them off as they're just opposed to me, stop and listen and see, is there a possibility of uniting a little bit here over a little bit of compromise? Nothing moral. Nothing about, you know, what God said thou shalt and thou shalt not, but just over paint colors. I mean, we did not put the color of faucets in those bathrooms that I wanted. I voted against that. I've been okay with it up till today. When I can tell you about, you know. But we have seen people fight over such trivial things because they never understood that you can disagree and still learn from that disagreement. This might not sound real spiritual to a lot of us, but it's really wise advice here. That when they're telling you what you don't want to hear, try and listen. I was young. I had hair on my head. It was a long time ago. Um... And the, the two deacons and the music leader asked to meet with me after church one Sunday night. We went in there and, and in the course of about 15 minutes basically told me to shape up or ship out. Can you imagine someone not wanting me around? Um, but <laughs> I went home angry that night. And I was, you know, ready to, okay, I'll scribble out that resignation letter. I don't need them. And then uh, the next day, one of the members called me, the wife of one of the guys I talked to, and we talked a little bit. Then one of the other guys that was best friend of one of the guys I talked to, they talked to me. I started seeing, I've kind of been a jerk here, haven't I? Because we listen a little, we start to find out that there's a little bit other perspective on how I'm doing and what I'm doing. And maybe, though I disagree with them, maybe I need to change a little bit too. God does that with us sometimes. When you got critics, we're always told, don't listen to the critics. Well, sometimes, maybe 10% of what those critics said might ought to listen. Instead, 
we've got a division in a country. Because political crisis are also spiritual crises. Our faith is not divorced from life. Look at verse 16. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them. Stop right there. You've been there, haven't you? You write your congressman, you vote, you try and do the right thing, but they're not listening, are they? Your representatives turn a deaf ear to you. And you're thinking it's a political thing, but understand, this is also a spiritual thing. Because look what they say. When all Israel saw the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king saying, What share have we in David? Look, David's been dead for two generations. But they still look to him. It's kind of like, what share have we got in JFK or FDR or, or Teddy Roosevelt or Lincoln or any? It'd be like us saying, look, there's the president that we'll always turn to. They always turn to David as the king. That is the example. And they're saying here, David is where the hope of Israel led. David is where the covenant was given. David is where God's promises come from. But you're telling us that because of your attitude, we no longer have a piece of David's covenants, of the promises made to him. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Well, let's just leave then. See, what they're saying is you're telling us we're not part of you anymore if you won't listen to us. Political crisis are always spiritual crisis also because it's always over values. It's always over what's most important. It's one thing to be Democrat or Republican, but when it comes to things like life, when it comes to be things like how many genders there are and what the basis of marriage is, when it comes to being, you know, we've had this movement of decriminalizing so many things that people have been charged for. The, the prosecuting attorneys in many cities have confused the police. Can we arrest, arrest a guy for this or not? Because for years we've been doing it, and suddenly, because you've got such a backlog of cases, you've decided we're not going to pursue those cases anymore giving petty thieves, shoplifters, you know, a green light, basically. And we, we're going to see long-term consequences of that kind of thing. It's a spiritual crisis that we lose a sense of what's right and wrong. When we don't listen to others, when we decide to serve ourselves, when we decide that I'm going to lead by force to get my way, Things fall apart. You can apply this to marriage if you've been in one that's broken up and you can kind of, you know, we were kind of like that. Our marital crisis were spiritual crisis because it was all about what was going on inside of us and what we wanted for ourselves and what our expectations were. Every fallout you've ever had kind of follows. And when you go back and evaluate, I could have been a little bit more grace and less force. I could have been a little bit more servant and less self-serving and so on down the line. And division comes because our faith cannot be divorced from how we live our daily lives. When we devalue and remove moral constraints, when we turn away from God, we go from, you know, Israel went from a world power to a banana republic. And quite certainly, I can see this nation heading in that direction. After the last, whether you agree or not, our constitution says that man was duly elected into the office of president. When people protest in the streets over the election... I think we got a problem there because we never did that before. We disagreed. We never broke windows and marched and all that stuff. It's time for us as Americans to get on our knees and realize that the crisis we face, our spiritual crisis, we can't leave God out. We can't keep Him off the throne of this country, of this city, of our homes. Because when we do, chaos results. What about you? You say, I'm not a leader. That's for all those other people. No, if you've got influence over anybody, from your children to your parents, the people at work, the people you teach in class, you are a leader. As one of God's people, you are called to be light and salt. That is a call to leading and influencing others. Are you going to be a servant or self-serving? Are you going to be graceful or forceful? Are you going to seek to listen and understand or just hear what you want to hear that agrees with you? The more we turn from Him,
the worse it's getting for us. But today is the day where you say, look, you're talking about listening. The wisest one we've got says, hear me, all you people, and be saved. It all begins, this new life that you can have, with listening to the words of Christ. That God sent His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That when Jesus told us this, He was telling us that this is where we can unite at. And as we do that, we can become one people. Have our minor differences, but as long as we're united around Christ and what His Word has said to us, we can be strong. That day may be today for you to take that step and say, Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ died upon that cross for my sins. I believe He rose from the grave. And with that, I'm in agreement with God. And with that, I become His child. And with that, I'm united with Him. And now I can be united with His people, His nation, His kingdom. And from there, I can just expand to my brothers and sisters around the world. That I am part of something big and united that will never split and never fall. The kingdom of God. Would you like to become a part of that? Today is your chance. We're going to have a song here in a moment. But there's time now for you to be praying and simply asking right there where you're at, right now, whatever's going on in your life, and asking Him, Lord, I believe. Would you come into my life?